we'll be joined by uh, Julian uh, from Raytheon. He's going to talk about the implications for cyber on the rise of AI. And, you know, in this space, I, I, we've already seen, they just released Fraud GPT, right, um, which is the jailbroken version of Chat GPT. Uh, there's two sides to this coin. They're good and there's bad. Uh, and uh, Julian's going to help us kind of understand both sides of that and, and uh, what we can do about it. So, Julian, welcome to the stage. First, thank you all very much for having me. I appreciate everybody's time for coming. Thank you. Got them. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the cyber implications with the rise of artificial intelligence. Go ahead. Ah, oh, perfect. <laughs> Even better. I love having clickers. Just a real quick background. Um, I've been doing this a very long time. I was a very, let's say, inquisitive child. Uh, <laughs> so I started programming in second grade. Um, and I know this is a bit unusual. Um, in basic in fourth grade, I started doing C and C++ and then started doing assembler and, and such in high school. Uh, I did my undergrad and master's in electrical engineering. Um, I wanted to do circuit design. And then I realized I would live on the East Coast and all of the circuit design was done here in California. Um, so I didn't end up going down that route. Uh, I worked for a place called the Vitreous State Lab. That was awesome. I did nuclear waste disposal research. And then I went on to NASA and Fannie Mae. And then 17 years ago, one of my buddies said, hey, you know all that stuff you used to do with taking apart things? I said, yeah. Like, how would you like to get paid to do that? God, that sounds great. Sure. Um, so 17 years later, uh, or 17 years ago, I moved to Raytheon, where I did offensive cyber work. I took apart things, modified how they worked. Awesome. I love it. Moved from offensive work into intelligence and then into defensive work. So at present, I sit as the Chief Technology Officer for Cyber Protection Solutions. Um, we cover all defensive solutions. So things from commercial to gov US government to even international. Uh, I'm considered a cyber and information operations expert. And just as a personal note, since we're here, I wanted to point out that I am actually on the D uh, NCCDC Red Team, the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition Red Team. And I also have multiple patents in uh, cyber. Outside of all of this, I love to race and climb and ski and all kinds of other fun stuff. Just to let you know, this is not a real technical talk. We don't have a lot of time, so I am going to be talking fast through most of this um, because I do want to get through it, but it does get a little bit technical. Real quick, some history on AI. There's this guy named Alan Turing. He was a very, very intelligent guy. He came up with this idea of testing artificial intelligence. He called it the imitation game. Okay. We know it as the Turing test. It was a test of a machine's ability to see if it actually had responses like a human, if it thought. Okay. This was back in 1950, right? Recently, you will see some stuff that says artificial intelligence has started to quote unquote pass the Turing test. This is very interesting, and it is definitely a mark in history. Okay, 2012, some researchers of our Google trained a neural network because it's on the internet, right? They look for cat images, of course, right? Gold standard of any tech company is to look for cat images. Uh, 2015, some somewhat intelligent people started to say, this artificial intelligence thing, like this could change things. This could be scary. What do we do about this? What happens if it becomes weaponized? Okay. So they said, well, let's, let's write a letter to the governments and say, we probably want to hold off a little bit on this kind of thing and, and going towards autonomous weapons. 2018. Okay. That's when open AI started, uh, GPT one. Okay. A lot of people didn't ever hear about GPT one or GPT two even, right? Because they weren't public. But now, 2020, we start getting into GPT-3. The public starts to just become aware of artificial intelligence and kind of where it's starting to go and how smart this could actually end up being. And then, of course, we progress a little further down. 2023, suddenly everybody's talking about AI. People are starting to use it to write resumes and proposals and, and papers in schools and things like that. Things are progressing very quickly. So, this talk is not about ethics, it's not about politics, but I'm gonna to touch on them. What if AI becomes sentient? Does it have rights? 
Okay. We just shut it down. Can we base human uh, decisions off of AI analytics? So if an AI makes a decision to go after something, is that good or bad? Does it make a difference if it's a human or artificial intelligence? Who is responsible if something happens? So if you look at this, right, that is a autonomous car. Won't name who it is. Obviously, it's been stricken. It sees a person and cars and things like that. What happens if it just suddenly decides to accelerate into a person? Who's responsible for that? Right? Who stops the weaponization? Is this like a nuclear thing where we say, here's an our, uh, arms treaty and AI shall not do this or it is limited to, to this? They're interesting questions. The politics side. This goes back to the sentient person. If people watch Star Trek, they'll understand this reference. Um, so in 2023, at least 25 states, now I'm just talking about US politics here, have introduced legislation, right? 14 of them actually have passed stuff, okay? They deal with impact of AI and operations, procurement and policy, okay, this is the important stuff. Unlawful discrimination. We know that AI can be biased, okay? Defining of a person. I thought this was very interesting. A couple states have come out and said, what is a person? Is AI a person? Okay. And it's studied for modern AI systems developed. So should we watch these systems? What are they going to do once we're developed? Okay. Now I've got all the background out of the way. Let's get to the real good stuff. The rise of saber and AI, uh, AI and cyber. Some interesting things, first off. When you start looking at things like the dark web, right? There are already things out there you can purchase, like fraud GPT, um, that'll help people hack, okay? It is AI-based. It'll help people attack you. There's even one called Brat GPT, which I think is just hilarious. And it's designed for world domination. It is the evil twin to chat GPT. It's hilarious. Look it up. And it is real. It actually uses internet connections to go and try to do bad things. Real quick, I just want to touch on one thing. There's a thing called dwell time in cyber. Dwell time means how long is an adversary in our network, right? Back in the early 2000s, this could be six months. Okay, so an adversary breaks into a network. They're there for six months. They're looking for things. They're exporting information, et cetera. Now, back then, transfer speeds were not that fast, so they would say, hey, I want this file, and they'd transfer it over a day or two, you know, over various, over various links and such. But nowadays, internet lines are much faster, but the dwell time has now gone down exceptionally, too. It's gone from six months to about 20 days. Now, think about that. We are still at 20 days that an actor comes in to our networks and sits there and starts looking for, bad, or for information to bring out. A long time. And that's a, the amount that they need to actually get the information is going down dramatically. We're starting to use, this is by the way present for cyber attacks. They're starting to use AI as throwing frameworks. Okay, so what is the throwing framework? You guys might have heard of things like Metasploit or Cobalt Strike, et cetera, right? What this is doing is it takes an exploit, right, that was developed and uses it against somebody. What's the advantage of using AI? Well, the AI can go look at the system and say, what is this vulnerable to? Is it vulnerable to these four exploits that I have? How expensive are each of these exploits? Do I want to use that really good one? Or can I use this okay-ish one to get in and get the information I need? So using it to be smart about attacking. It's actively being used to develop new exploits. This is still in its infancy, okay? But we now have seen that AI is taking apart binaries at a rudimentary level and starting to look for exploits, whether that be buffer overflows, et cetera, right? The interesting one is AI is also being, mod uh, is, um, malware is being modified with AI-like features. I won't say it's smart yet. Black Mamba is a good example, right? Exploits, 
Uh, LLMs are large language models. That's a whole other talk I can give <laughs> on uh, to synthesize keylogger functionality. So watching your keyboard, right? But it does so on the fly. This is very interesting stuff. Get a chance to go look this up. Okay. So as I said, it's reducing the amount of time that the actors are actually in the networks. They don't need to be there that long. You can train an AI that says, hey, I want these keys to the kingdom. This particular drawing, this Visio, this uh, financial record, et cetera. And you can train an AI to go in there and say, just go look for it. And it'll go in, find what it needs, and exit. Use all the exploits along the way. Why is it important? Well, now my dwell time, it doesn't matter if I can find them in 20 days. They're only there for five minutes. They can exploit the whole chain, come in, get what they need, and get out in five minutes. So we need to be able to detect them within that window. We no longer have the long periods that we used to have. There's also attacks on LLMs that we're starting to see. Okay, look at this picture. What does the green say? It says a car is a cake. So if it thinks it's a cake, it might just go ahead and run over that, right? Who cares if I run over a cake? By the way, if you want to look up the more information on this, you can look up down there. It's uh, learning physical uh, vehicle camouflages to adversarially attack detectors in the wild. Stuff. So I, I jokingly say, everybody has AI, right? It's the new buzzword. You hear artificial intelligence and machine learning and quantum to some extent. That's going to be probably the next one down the road. But it's true. So a lot of companies are starting to integrate artificial intelligence into their products. So you have companies like CrowdStrike with Charlotte AI. You have Blue Voyant um, with their MDR solution. Palo Alto developing their own LLMs for security focus. So they're developing their own large language models just for their products. Pretty interesting. I'm not using uh, open AIs. Mixed mode is another interesting one. That's a, I think they call it a third wave uh, AI system, right? It doesn't need to be trained, okay? You can have it literally just go and look at your network and it just starts over about a week, learns your network and learns what's odd about that network, okay? We're starting to see it in SIMS and XDR solutions, et cetera, to do threat hunt. So looking through all of this network data NetFlow, et cetera, um, for threats. There's just too much of it. That's one of the things that we've realized in cybersecurity. Back, I remember many years ago, we would do PCAPs, right? We would do full PCAP capture. That means full traffic capture. We would take apart things, look for bad things, and try to upload it. There's just too much nowadays. And even it's getting too much for NetFlow. I call it death by a billion paper cuts, or even a trillion, depending on the system, right? NetFlow, by the way, is the two from addresses for every single packet on the network. Um, so information are going across the network. How do you look through all of this stuff to find the bad guys? It's just too much. We can't do it manually anymore. We have to use AI to do that kind of thing. Their intelligence, using this quite a bit, actually. So they're looking at dark web for indicators. How, um, <laughs> I always say hackers love to brag, it's so true. You go onto the dark web and you'll see, hey, I just broke into X system. And you're like, thanks guys. Now we know we're breached, let's, let's figure out how that happened, right? SOC analysts are starting to be augmented by artificial intelligence. So you have analysts that are sitting there, they're looking up an event, and on the side is an artificial intelligence saying, hey, here's DNS records, here's the NetFlow associated with what you're, with, what you're looking at, et cetera. So they're starting to be augmented, right? The people, because there's, again, too much information. If they can bring the information faster to the analysts, they can make quicker decisions. And that's what this is all about. Identity and access management. This is an interesting one, okay? They're starting to use artificial intelligence to look through all of the data. Did Julian scan in this morning into the building? Did he bring his normal laptop and log into that? So now I'm like, okay, so he scanned into the building, so that's probably him, right? He logged into his laptop, okay, better confidence that it's him, right? 
you know, is he surfing? Is he answering mails in the normal way, in the normal times that he normally does? As the confidence gets higher, right, I'll go let him have access to more and more information. And we're starting to see those systems come out. Um, and they're, they're amazing, right? We're no longer reliant on passwords and two-factor and, and things like that to do this. We're looking at confidence scores of people. All right. A little bit about the future. So from a defensive perspective, from the near side, okay, you're going to hear people talk about zero trust a lot and things like that. I'm going to take zero trust and, and apply it to this, okay, which is you're going to start seeing the incorporation of not just net flow and, and other things from the network. You're going to start seeing things from the physical side. Do we have physical sensors inside of the hardware? to watch for bugs in the hardware, firmware, et cetera. We have operating system. That one's pretty well covered, right? The data, systems that are actively watching data for odd oddities. User I went over before, how confident am I, am I that this person is that person, right? The network inside, external threat feeds, et cetera. We'll throw in cloud, of course. Bring all of this data together to find out what is the purpose of whatever is happening on the network and generate vectors, right? Okay, this is a stream here. They're printing off stuff. This is, you know, a file share, et cetera. In the future, we're going to start seeing business logic, okay? Does Julian or should Julian have access to HVAC drawings for our buildings? Mm, eh, not really. I probably shouldn't quite honestly, but why is he accessing them? Things like that, the business logic starts to creep in. This is, keep in mind, like just adding business logic, looking for things on the dark web, things like that, it adds a tremendous amount of complexity and data, okay? The monitoring, I should have bolded that, monitoring of VIPs and high value targets, okay? CEO, CTO, CISOs, et cetera, right? They have access to lots of financial data and other things that could be very interesting to attackers. So a uh, little bit about DevSecOps pipelines, all right? So actively looking through source code, okay? We have systems that look through source code now, but they use very static mindsets. Some of them are a little bit more dynamic, right? But actively having AI search through source code for prob uh, problems and probabilities of exploits, definitely coming. Near real time, okay, near real time blocking of threats. So this scares a lot of people, but at some point, because actors are coming and going so quickly out of the network and getting what they're access to, we have to turn over the reins to our own artificial intelligence to combat that faster, okay? Artificial intelligence can come into the network, monitor all the things that you saw in the previous slide at a much faster rate than any human analyst and find the bad actors or bad AI, right? And stop them in their tracks in that five minute window that they're taking nowadays. And the far off, what we're hoping to see is predictive cyber. Talked a little bit about that previously. So we are starting to use a lot of the indicators, you know, it goes way beyond, do I see a port scan and things like that? It's monitoring social media, et cetera, right? Oh, this is the new type of threat. Is that kind of threat um, one that I should be looking at? How can I proactively prevent that threat from coming? This is the predictive cyber side. It is very difficult, okay? How do I predict that attack is coming? We're gonna get there. So a little bit about offense too, okay? So automated hunting of exploits, that is here, okay? We're starting to use artificial intelligence to do hunting of exploits, the governments, et cetera, and even uh, corporations. I always call the modern day mafia, right? The malware writers, okay? The old mafia would exploit for money. Well, nowadays, the modern mafia are malware writers. They exploit malware for financial gain. They're starting to use artificial intelligence to find exploits within systems that they can gain financially. The interesting thing is far 
When I say far, by the way, near and far, near is in the next year. Far means year at plus. I'll just put it to you that way. What we're starting to think is that we will start seeing artificial intelligence approach a system and develop an a exploit automatically as it looks at the system, saying, these are the available ports, this is what's running on them. Oh, I don't see any exploits available in the, the wild, CVs, etc. Let me see what I can do to attack that system automatically in real time um, while I'm doing the attack. So again, you have this chain, right? Artificial intelligence has a target. I want to get to over there. How do I get there? Oh, let me look at this stuff. It's doing this all automatically and at speed. Okay, that's what this is about. That goes to the deterministic path discovery. But the automatic coven, uh, hunting is what I was just talking about, actually. Full intelligence gathering. So I give the, at a target. It goes and it does all the research on the dark web or across the internet. And it says, okay, I want to attack that target. It's running Inject web, you know. Let me go after that. Oh, I don't have an exploit for it. Let me create one. All automatically in real time. We see multiple AI agents already acting cohesively. I shouldn't say cohesively. They act independently in some ways. So it'll say, hey, the first stage, this AI is going after it. It gets to the first stage. Okay, that, hand that over to that AI, then can continue the stages, right? I need to go after this file now, et cetera. The FAR is multiple AI agents working in cohesion with each other to achieve a target. Okay. This could be from separate systems, could be from separate parts of the world, et cetera. Imagine training LLMs for a specific purpose and then setting them free. So highly customized phishing. You turn artificial intelligence uh, out on the web, what happens? They start learning about your VIPs and your high value targets. And they say, oh, Julian has a child in soccer. Let me send him a soccer, right? That's kind of traditional stuff. But they're doing it automatically now using artificial intelligence. Let's take it to the next level. That's for phishing. What if we start doing that to track targets? Multi-int, for those that don't know, is multi-intelligence, multi-mode intelligence, meaning taking different modes, web, traffic cameras, et cetera. Okay? Taking intelligence from wherever it can to track a target. This is where AI is headed. Imagine AI tracking you. Okay? You think Google's bad. <laughs> So, and I'm looking at time. So within LLMs, large language models, we're already starting to see poisoning, right? Imagine if an LLM was attacked. Right now, it's kind of obvious. It, it changes the model in slight ways. But if you have multiple LLMs, can you create a change here, create a change here, and when they act together, it creates a, a bad thing together, okay? That's what we're starting to, well, in the future, we're going to start seeing. Poisoning of multi-mode models, essentially. I would be amiss if I didn't mention some of this stuff. Okay, I know this is an AI talk, but I am going to talk a little bit about quantum computing things. For those that haven't looked it up, take a look at the traveling salesman problem, okay? Salesman has to go to 50 locations across the U.S. What's the most optimal route across the U.S. in order to visit those 50 locations? Right? Traditional computers have a hard time with this kind of thing. They do. Public traveling salesman problem for a reason. Quantum computing, because it operates quite differently, does not have this issue. It solved that very quickly. What does that mean from a cyber perspective? Okay. Much more intelligent attacks can take place because we're going to start using artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Okay. How it gets to various targets, much faster. If I see dwell times go down by 10x with AI, it's probably going to be 100x for quantum. Okay. That same thought can be applied to software. So previously unfound problems within software are going to be much easier to find 
in quantum. Okay. What if we entangle parts of hardware that we deliver to everybody's enterprise, right? And Tingle, by the way, is a quantum turn. You can look it up. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to go into all of this. And now we remotely eavesdrop on that hardware with the entangled particles. Okay, so there's chips and things like that, or pathways that we can watch inside of a machine that is entangled. Yes, this is far out, but it is something that we have to think about. The one that everybody always points out is traditional encryption, right? Traditional encryption will become more difficult to break. It doesn't instantly break it, but it will become more difficult or more e uh, become easier to break, excuse me, right? And new and unforeseen thoughts. What will quantum computing bring from a cybersecurity perspective that we're just not thinking about yet? I don't know. And with that, I actually don't know if we can do questions, but uh, <laughs> um, I'll leave it up there. Hopefully, I presented you guys some data and arranged it in some way that you guys thought was compelling and made you guys think a little bit. Thank you all very much. If you guys have questions, feel free to ask. <laughs> Thank you.